Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's webinar. My name is Roxana, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's um, MSA webinar on mental health and disordered eating. Okay. A little about myself. I'm currently a second year medical student at the John A. Burns School of Medicine in Honolulu, Hawaii, and currently serve as one of the two at-large MS1 officers. During tonight's presentation, um, please enter your questions in the chat. And after all four of our presentations, I will moderate a Q&A. So it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker panel of the AMSSM members that are experts on tonight's topic, and we're truly fortunate to have the opportunity to learn from them. Our speakers include Dr. Lee A. Mancini, Dr. Elizabeth A. Joy, Dr. Aurelia Nativ, and our very first speaker tonight is Dr. Alex B. Diamond. Dr. Diamond is a director of the Vanderbilt Youth Sports Health Center and an associate professor at the Departments of Orthopedic Surgery, Pediatrics, and Neurological Surgery near, um, at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He's a graduate of Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, completed a residency in pediatrics at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, and received both his fellowship training in primary care sports medicine and his master's of public health at Vanderbilt University. He serves as a team physician for several high schools, Vanderbilt University, and the Nashville Predators. Dr. Diamond is a member of the Executive Committee of the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics Council on Sports Medicine and Fitness and the Chair of the Community Advocacy Subcommittee for the American Medical Association for Sports Medicine. He is a member of the Sports Medicine Advisory Committee for the National Federation of State High School Associations, or NFHS, and is a consultant for the Tennessee Secondary School Athletic Association, or TSSAA. Um, Dr. Diamond has over 50 publications, and his research focuses on injury prevention and the promotion of health and safety in youth sports. Dr. Diamond will now begin his presentation about the AMSSM position statement on mental health issues and psychological factors in athletes, detection, management, effect on performance, and prevention. Thanks, Roxana. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, so I do want to, um, you know, recognize uh, my my partners who uh, worked on this uh, paper. It was a Herculean effort, and so uh, co-chairs uh, of our group, doctors uh, Cindy Chang and Margot uh, Putukian, uh, who really put together this amazing group and uh, helped uh, keep us marching marching along to to get this done. And then uh, our co-authors, doctors uh, Ernie Hong, uh, Ingram Reardon, and and Wallen. And uh, if you are interested in, in taking a look through it later, it was published in 2020 in both the uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine and the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, it is, uh, as I mentioned, it was a pretty Herculean effort. It was 61 pages of text, which does not actually include the 314 references. Uh, and so for the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes that I have, I, I thought we could dive deep into the 26,000 uh, words from the, from the statement. And so um, obviously uh, we can't do that, but really what we did in the paper is uh, as a group, we tried to identify what we thought were some of the most uh, common and important uh, mental health conditions uh, and disorders that uh, would affect our, our athletes. And uh, we came up with these 14 uh, personality issues, sexuality and gender issues, hazing, bullying, sexual misconduct, transitioning from sport, psychological response to injury and illness, self-medication as a response to injury, illness, eating disorder, disordered eating, as you just heard about, depression and suicide, anxiety, stress, overtraining, sleep, and finally ADHD. And then for each of those topics, uh, we provided uh, essential background information, but then really focused on how do we detect these issues? How do we manage them? What's their effect on an athlete's performance? And finally, how do we, how do we prevent it? And so certainly you can sit down and read through it, but I, I think it's also can serve as a nice reference for you as you have a particular issue to go back and, and look through those particular topics. And so really for the rest of my talk, I'm not going to dive deep into each of those again. Like I said, it, it's just way too uh, much in the weeds as you heard earlier. But what I'd like to do is sort of talk on some of the key points I think came out from our paper uh, as we review these different topics. And so anything time I give a talk like this, I think it's really important to just understand that overall in the big picture, 
sports are good for mental health. I know we're going to focus on some uh, some of the negatives and the particular stressors that, that come with sports for our athletes and their mental health, um, but we can't forget that uh, overall sports is overwhelmingly good for mental health. And we know that kids who play sports Sports tend to have fewer emotional and behavioral problems. They're less likely to do drugs, participate in risky activities, or have a bad body image. Uh, we see them have improved self-esteem, social skills, and, and discipline. And that we've seen that the prevalence of mental health disorders are lower in the athletic population compared to the general population, particularly when we talk about young, young people. And also with a lot of the, the work that Dr. Joy has done with the exercise and his medicine and that we see that physically active children have improved mental health compared with children who have a more sedentary or screen-based lifestyle. But athletes are at risk uh, and they are susceptible to the same exact things we are. They are regular people uh, who have families and, and school and work and friends. And so they're have the same experience, the same range of mental health concerns that uh, the rest of the general population does. But they also have their own set of unique concerns and issues that go with the competition of sport, training for sport, the pressures of sport, balancing time, unique relationships that exist between uh, their coaches and themselves and their parents uh, and their teammates um, that can create um, issues for them. Uh, and we see this increasing uh, with, with time. Again, uh, we particularly so in, in our athletic population age in that 18 to 25 uh, range is where we're seeing tremendous amount of growth in the prevalence and type and severity of, of mental illness. And so, as I mentioned, uh, athletes are subject to a number of stressors, both unique to sports and uh, also common to all of us. But just the very nature of competition can result in triggering a new psychological concern, exacerbate an existing one, or cause a past concern to resurface. And so the, the big picture from this slide uh, and the next one is that you will see this in your career. Um, it is common uh, and is becoming more common. One of every four to five youths experience some, uh, experiences a, a severe impairment during the lifetime from mental health disorder. So not just any impairment, a severe level of impairment uh, in their quality, in their uh, ability to conduct daily life functions. Uh, and in fact, many emotional and behavioral disorders that we're seeing in kids and teens are actually higher than some very well-known physical things like asthma and diabetes. And close to 8% of our young kids, uh, kids and, and adolescents are on medication for mental health disorders at, at this point. Point. And about 46 million adults uh, about 10 years ago uh, experienced a mental um, illness, um, but that was double the rate. And again, in our younger athletic population than it was in our older uh, population. Uh, anxiety and depression is the leading uh, mental health illness um, that you will see. Uh, over a third of all undergraduates reported uh, a level of depression that limited their function. And in the age group of uh, 10 to 24, suicide is the second leading cause of death, uh, which is really just a, a shocking and heartbreaking number. Uh, if we think about this uh, supposedly being um, one of the, the highlight times of, of our lives. Um, and then uh, thanks to a lot of work by Dr. Rao and Hong, uh, um, also AMSSM members, uh, have studied this uh, a lot in NCAA athletes and shown that, again, even though we see this and it's absolutely tragic uh, for entire communities when this happens, the rates are actually lower in, in student athletes compared to the general population of college uh, individuals. And part of the issue with, with mental health is that certainly not only is it extremely prevalent um, and it's uh, complex managing it, um, but on top of that, uh, it's usually not seen in isolation, which uh, really complicates the picture. And so 40% who have mental health uh, uh, illness have an additional comorbidity that tends to complica complicate that condition and, and how we provide care for them. And then not only is care complicated and there's multiple comorbidities with it, is that people who do have issues oftentimes tend not to seek care or able to receive care. And the majority of individuals who have mental health illness never end up receiving care. Only uh, less than 25% actually make it uh, to a healthcare facility. 
and even less so with our, our student athlete uh, pop, or our athlete population in general, less than 10% of them actually utilize counseling services uh, available to them. And so this brings up this concept called the gladiator barrier. Uh, and so we know mental health has a stigma throughout the general society, and it's somehow tied to this idea of, of weakness. And so uh, athletes certainly don't want that perception. They um, certainly um, pride themselves on being physically strong and mentally strong. And so um, when a, a mental health condition comes up and you have this idea of, of being weak, um, it gets heightened in athletes because they fear the loss of the strength and the loss of them looked at as a role model in society and they lose self-esteem. Uh, and because of this, um, there's this loss of help seek seeking behaviors that we, that we saw. Um, in addition, uh, because they have such great physical strength, strength, this are, there's this false perception that they're immune to mental health issues. And so um, they may be really struggling inside, even though on the outside, they look like the picture of health. And so we in sports medicine really need to shift the narrative uh, that there's mental health and there's physical health or that there's, uh, and so mental health is part of sports medicine. Uh, it's not something separate. It's not a different entity. And so we need to treat um, these uh, patients the same way that we do uh, as an ACL injury and ankle sprain. Care needs to be easily accessible. It needs to be approachable. And we need to provide the same level of resources that, that we do um, with those concerns and, and injuries. And along those lines, we need to really transform the way society uh, approaches uh, mental, mental health. And I think we're starting to get there, which is great. You know, the way things are now are dramatically different than they were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, for sure. And as I mentioned before, sports are overwhelmingly a positive thing for, for mental health. And we see that, we're starting to see that more and more, not only just as you know, we do things, uh, you know, physically active keeps, uh, improves our mental health, but we're actually starting to see it as an intervention, as a directed intervention uh, on mental health. And youth athletics may provide one of the more, most strategic opportunities to combat childhood trauma and improve our the emotional health of our young people. And so this uh, study just a few, few years ago by Mata showed that children who play sports are less likely to go through symptoms of depression when compared to those who do not take part in sports. And that effect was even greater for kids who played more than one sport. And so encouraging kids to take part in sports uh, may actually be an effective early intervention for children who are at risk. So imagine pushing insurance companies to actually pay for kids to enroll in sports or pay for communities to have sports, positive sports programming, as opposed to waiting till they're actually in the system and actually uh, having issues and concerns. Uh, you may be familiar with this concept called ACEs, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And what those are are uh, sexual and physical abuse, emotion, emotional neglect, parental substance misuse or, or parental incarceration or living in a single parent household. Uh, the AP recommends screening for these uh, regularly at a child's well uh, visits. Uh, but, but what they have found is that any one of these um, conditions that a child may be living through makes it more difficult for them to su succeed in school, live a healthy life and contribute to society's future. And so uh, what Easterlin found, uh, again, in the study just uh, three years ago, was that adolescents who experienced one of these ACE events in childhood had better mental health in adulthood if they played sports in their youth. And that intervention was even greater for those who played team sports compared to individual, but it affected for both. The, so this is great news. Um, but the problem is, is that children with ACEs tend to live in families uh, with lower uh, levels of socioeconomic status and income. And so as youth sports, Sports become more and more professionalized. We're leaving these kids who need sports more than ever for multiple reasons I would just mention is that we may be leaving them further and further behind in the need. And so it's important for us, again, as providers to understand the barriers to care that our athletes uh, uniquely experience. We need to start normalizing health seeking behaviors when it comes to mental health. The PPE. This is a great time to screen for anxiety and depression. Uh, questions have been added in the most recent uh, edition that focus on this. Um, asking about the eating disorder questions, substance use, and asking when there aren't issues 
helps to normalize it so that when you do see them, when there is a concern and is an issue, you're not new to them. It's not a new conversation that you have had. I think the other thing, just we have emergency action plans for concussion and sudden cardiac arrest and heat, heat injury or illness, we need to have a mental health emergency action plan as well. And that needs to be written out in practice, just like we do for our other EAPs. And where we've seen these sort of benefits from sport is that the greater benefits in mental health occur when that athlete feels connected, socially accepted, and having improved self-esteem. And for sport, you can't just say you play a sport and you get those benefits. There, there's got to be some work put into it. And that's where I talk about trans, transformational sport versus transactional sport. Trans, trans, transformational sport means that you show that athlete that they belong and matter for who they are and not how they perform, which would be transactional. And so approaching the athlete um, it can be a difficult experience. It's uncomfortable. These are hard things to talk about. Um, but a, a few uh, tips that I think I've found helpful. One is, again, avoid passing judgment. Uh, be, be an empathetic uh, listener. Um, encourage um, them to talk openly. Uh, you're not there to, to fix the problem, but you're there to listen and work with them uh, to get the help that they need. Be as factual as possible. Don't... Um, opinionize, don't blame others. Um, you don't know that relation. It's a complicated relationship. You, know, you may hear someone complain about a coach, but that coach may also be the one person in their life where they get a, a lot of support from. So, so you don't want to um, you know, sort of uh, negatize uh, individuals. Uh, focus on them as a person, not as an athlete. Um, and again, minimize the stigma about mental health care and that this is, this is their health, just like a physical complaint would be. And then uh, finally, um, we want to encourage our student athletes to seek help. Uh, again, this should be something that's routinely done. Uh, let them know that you're, you're there for them as a person and not just as an athlete. Um, we want to, again, I'm not a mental health professional. Um, those of us on the um, call going into sports medicine, uh, we're, we're not psychiatrists, psychologists. But I think what we do do is have a, a really close relationship with our student athletes. Uh, we know them. Um, and so improving our recognition of things that they may be going through and our response to their concerns is really important. And so um, quick referral um, to our colleagues. Uh, this is a, a real uh, important example of how the athletic uh, care network is important. So athletic trainers, physical therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, and us all have to work together to help these athletes. Um, and then I think one of the, the bigger things that, um, that I've learned is that uh, we want to assist with mental health when they are just issues uh, before they become incidents. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Diamond, for that comprehensive, amazing speech um, and presentation. Our following two speakers are Dr. Elizabeth Joy and Dr. Aurelia Nativ. And so a little bit about both of our speakers. Dr. Elizabeth Joy is the Senior Medical Director for Wellness and Nutrition at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, Utah. Dr. Joy practices family medicine and sports medicine at the Salt Lake uh, Livy Well Center. She is an adjunct faculty member at the University of Utah School of Medicine in the Department of Family and Preventative Medicine and in the College of Health Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology. Dr. Joy is the past president of the American College of Sports Medicine and the Female Athlete Triathlon Coalition. She chairs the Exercises Medicine Governance Committee for the ACSM and serves as the board of directors for the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance. Her research interest lies in the area of diabetes prevention, physical activity promotion, and the female athlete triad. Dr. Aurelia Natif is a professor at the UCLA Division of Sports Medicine and Non-Operative Orthopedics, Department of Family Medicine and Orthopedic Surgery. She has served as the Director of UCLA Metabolic Bone and Osteoporosis Center for the over 20 years and currently the UCLA Bone Health Practice. Dr. Natif is an Associate Team Physician for UCLA Athletics 
and has been involved as a team physician and or consultant with several national governing bodies, including USA Gymnastics and USA Track and Field, as well as the USOC. She is the past president of the Female and Male Athlete Triad Coalition and has served on the board of directors of AMSSM for two terms and ACSM, and is a fellow of both AMSSM and ACSM. Dr. Nati's research and publications are in the area of prevention and management of bone stress injuries, bone health, or osteoporosis, and the female and male athlete triad. Doctors Joy and Nati will now be presenting on the management of the female and male athlete triad. Thank you so much, Roxanne. I appreciate the opportunity to present to everyone this evening. Um, we'll start by defining the female athlete triad, describe screening, evaluation, and treatment. We're going to share an approach to clearance and return to play, not get too far into the weeds there. Um, then Aurelia will take over and talk about the male athlete triad and pathophysiology, along with reviewing some injuries that are observed in our males who are affected by the triad. So the female athlete triad was actually defined back in 1992, a group of physicians and scientists gathered in Washington, DC, because they had observed this relationship between eating disorders and loss of menstruation and bone stress injuries. And they really defined the triad as these three interrelated entities of disordered eating, amenorrhea, and osteoporosis. And it seemed to be most affecting young female athletes who participated in sports where leanness conferred a competitive advantage. And the original American College of Sports Medicine position stand was published in 1997 and then updated in 2007, um, during which Dr. Natif served as the lead author. During that 2007 update, um, we really described a, this, this concept of a spectrum of symptoms and conditions between health and disease. And we identified low energy availability as really kind of the root cause of the triad. And this low energy availability state may evolve from either disordered eating or an eating disorder, or it may just be a mismatch between what the athlete is consuming in terms of their daily energy intake relative to their energy expenditure associated with sport. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you know, we define low energy availability as the amount of dietary energy remaining for other body functions after exercise training. So you can kind of see the equation right here. EA or energy availability is defined as kcals per kilo of fat-free mass per day. And it equals um, the average energy intake minus the average exercise energy expenditure divided by fat-free mass. So in this example, if somebody has a dietary energy intake of 2000 kcals per day, an exercise energy expenditure of 600, so let's say they're running on average about six miles per day, they have a fat-free mass of 51 kilos, you can see that calculates out to be an EA of 27.5. And I can tell you, it's a little on the low side. So, you know, my practice is about, um, oh, 85% uh, caring for um, patients who have eating disorders, um, predominantly females, but some males as well. Um, when we think about our female athlete population, we know that eating disorders are more common in athletes compared to non-athletes. And when we look at the type of sports, those who are involved in aesthetic sports are more likely than those who participate in endurance sports who are more likely than those who participate in ball sports to be affected by eating disorders. But I can assure you that all of them are at risk. And we see uh, more eating disorders amongst our females in general, and also amongst female athletes compared to males. We know that athletic performance suffers as a result of eating disorders, no surprise there. Um, but I thought it was interesting that a, a relatively recent study of high school athletes with disordered eating behaviors were found to be twice as likely to sustain a musculoskeletal injury during their competitive season compared to those females who did not have disordered eating behaviors. And also female athletes who you know, meet a DSM-5 diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, have a low BMI, those who um, meet diagnostic criteria for bulimia and are purging you know, multiple times per day should be categorically restricted from participation in sport. 
this is what that spectrum looks like. And let's start in the upper right-hand corner. You know, these in the green, these are individuals who have optimal energy availability, eumenorrhea, or they're having regular periods and they have optimal bone health. And as they move from the upper right-hand corner to the lower left-hand corner, they kind of go through this phase where it's possible that they have reduced energy availability with or without disordered eating. They may have subclinical menstrual disorders. Maybe they are um, anovulatory, but still having um, some cycling uh, at least nine times per year. They have um, a kind of a negative bone mineral balance, but they don't they may not necessarily meet criteria for osteopenia or osteoporosis. And then in the lower left-hand corner, you know, we really see pathology. Those who have low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, they have functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and osteoporosis. So, um, so let's, let's go through this slide together. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, we're gonna end at the lower right-hand corner. So in that low energy availability state, it results in some changes in um, how the brain is serving as our body's quarterback. Um, and specifically, we see changes and a, a, a decrease in both the amplitude as well as the frequency of gonadotropin releasing hormone pulses. So that's kind of that first X that you see in the middle part of this diagram. That in turn results in a decrease in the release of both um, follicle stimulating hormone and then luteinizing hormone, um, which influence the ovarian production of both estrogen and progesterone. And so ultimately that results in functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. And people say functional, well, what the heck does function mean? Well, the function of hypothalamic amenorrhea is to prevent pregnancy. And I ask all of you to think back to your high school history classes when you heard about times of great famine across the world, you know, and the birth rates plummets. And so, you know, when a woman has low energy availability, you know, whether it's due to famine or it's due to a mismatch between her energy intake and her exercise energy expenditure, you know, it creates a state where, you know, were she to become pregnant, a fetus is nothing more than a parasite right? And it's taking energy away. And the brain's job is to support the self. I mean, that is a key take-home point here. The brain's job is to support the self. And in the setting of low energy availability, it turns off your ability to reproduce as a strategy to prevent further energy loss. But it has an unintended consequence. And as well-designed as the human body is, you know, absent estrogen, particularly amongst adolescents, you know, who are supposed to be gaining the most amount of bone mass, you combine that with weight bearing exercise and you get what you see here on the right. And this is a recent MRI of one of my patients who has a devastating bone stress injury. She has a through and through stress fracture that goes anterior to posterior, medial to lateral of her proximal one third tibia. And it has been a devastating, potentially career ending injury for her. So there's lots of screen that we recommend for the female athlete triad, you know, that has to do with, you know, menstruation and, um, and disordered eating and eating disorders, and obviously for bone health. And all of this can be found on the female and male athlete triad.org website. And I encourage you, if you wanna learn more to go to that website. But optimal screening for the triad occurs during the pre-participation um, physical evaluation, and it includes a number of questions. Do you worry about your weight? Are you trying to, or has anyone recommended that you gain or lose weight? Are you on a special diet, or do you avoid certain types of foods? Have you ever had an eating disorder? Do you have any concerns you want to discuss with your doctor? And then some questions about menstruation. So when we identify somebody who has an eating disorder or has the triad, you know, the gold standard is multidisciplinary care. And, you know, I mean, this is the medical student interest group. We are all, you know, physicians. Um, and, but we only, um, we are only successful in caring for that athlete if we work in close partnership with our registered dietitians and mental health professionals. And, you know, I liked, I've been drawing this picture for almost 30 years. Almost, yeah, almost 30 years. 
And I like to say that we were doing patient-centered care before anybody actually called it that. But I realized very quickly that there's no way I could care for these patients by myself. And you know the arrows on the outside of that triangle indicate that bi-directional communication that has to take place between all members of the multidisciplinary care team. So again, we're, you know, the care we deliver is only as good as the partnerships we create with our colleagues. So Aurelia and I have been very involved with a group of, um, of, of scientists and clinicians you know, to um, uh, try and determine how we can best uh, screen, evaluate, um, and uh, determine whether or not people, um, you know, in this case, female athletes are safe enough to participate in sport, you know, given um, the underlying problems that can occur as the result of low energy availability. And we look at a variety of risk factors that you see listed on the left-hand side. Um, and then we've um, quantified a magnitude of risk across the top. And we can check these boxes and come up with a score. And based on that score, this is the, the lower table here, somebody who has a score of zero to one points, we consider to be at low risk. Somebody with a score of two to five points, you know, would be at um, moderate risk and it would you know, influence our clearance decisions about their ability to return to play. And somebody with six or more points may in fact end up being restricted from training and competition you know, for some period of time. And all of this work has been largely led by a really group of um, very committed um, practitioners um, in both uh, clinical medicine and exercise science and really looking at, you know, what is the underlying mechanism of the female and male athlete triad and understanding that how do we do a better job of both preventing it, identifying people who um, are at risk or who have the triad and then helping them to engage in um, evidence-based interventions. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about the female and male athlete triad, I really encourage you to go to the um, coalition website and I've incurred that URL on the bottom of this slide. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aurelia. Great, hi everyone. Thank you, Liz. Uh, continuing on, uh, we felt that it was uh, a natural uh, progression to now talk about um, a relatively uh, new official diagnosis that was just published last year in the Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine but known for a long time that there was a similar parallel in the male athlete um, that we are now calling the male athlete triad. And similarly, it's a syndrome of three interrelated conditions that are most common in young male endurance and weight class athletes. And it includes the clinically relevant outcomes of energy deficiency or low energy availability with or without disordered eating or eating disorders functional hypothalamic hypogonadism, and osteoporosis or low bone mineral density with or without bone stress injury. And these are the references that um, were in the Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine. There was a part one that talks about definition and scientific basis, and a part two that talks about the diagnosis, treatment, and return to play. So everything that um, that I'm stating today is in a much more detail in these two papers that again were published uh, last year. And um, the, these are the main references for my portion of the talk. Next slide, please. Uh, the model for the male athlete triad is uh, based on the female athlete triad model because of the importance of these three components. And that includes uh, for the male athlete triad, low energy availability, uh, moderate energy deficiency as an intermediate point, but on the fine, far left, you'll see very low EA. And we'll talk about the difference in a minute um, with the female athlete triad. Um, and severe energy deficiency with or without disordered eating, functional hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and osteoporosis with or without bone stress injury. Um, again, you see the intermediate points in blue um, of the spectrum, and then the optimal uh, triangle in green. Next slide, please. So similar um, to the female athlete triad, the athletes may not present with all three components at the same time. 
but identification of any one component should prompt thorough assessment of the others. So it's very similar to the female athlete triad. Um, there is kind of a time lapse in that uh, many times these other, the other um, spectrums may occur because they're so interrelated, but um, they're not always at the exact same time. Uh, different from the female athlete, um, the evidence that we have to date does suggest that a more severe energy deficiency or a lower energy availability state is needed to affect the reproductive and skeletal health in the male athlete than in the female athlete triad. So it's a very, uh, uh, again, many observations have pointed to this and um, I wanted to emphasize this distinction. Um, similar to the female athlete triad, the diagnosis of the male athlete triad is best accomplished by this multidisciplinary medical team uh, that Liz spoke of, including the team physician. Uh, we recommend a sports dietitian, ideally one that specializes in eating disorders and disordered eating. And in a mental health professional, if the disordered eating or clinical eating disorders is present. Uh, the treatment does focus similar to the female athlete triad on improving the energetic status through optimal fueling. Um, so that is the mainstay of treatment is improved fueling. Next slide, and or nutrition. Uh, focusing on a little difference with disordered eating and eating disorders in the male athlete uh, uh, and similarities. The similarities being that um, we're also seeing the male athlete that we see it often in the leanness sports. Um, and these are the same athletes that are at risk for developing disorder eating and eating disorders. Um, we know that the disorder eating behaviors can manifest differently in the male athlete compared to the female athlete, um, in part related to the differing society, societal and cultural body ideals between the sexes. Um, and in particular, the men wanting to improve muscularity or striving for a combination of muscularity and thinness that may contribute to these differences. So these have shown up on um, a number of studies as this um, uh, focus on muscularity as well as thinness. Next slide, please. Uh, the most comprehensive information that we have available regarding the prevalence of eating disorders in the male athlete is from Yoran Sangha Borgen um, a number of years ago where she um, studied uh, basically the entire population of the Norwegian athletes, both male and female, and identified that 8% of male athletes were at risk um, and subsequently met the diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder um, at that time in 2004. Um, sports with the highest prevalence of male athletes who met the criteria for an eating disorder in this study, and this has been reproduced in multiple more current studies, um, are those categorized as anti-gravitation sports, so the jumpers, um, rock climbers, and um, especially also with the weight class sports, so wrestling, martial arts, and weightlifting in this particular study. Um, similarly, a high prevalence of disordered eating or extreme body weight cutting behaviors has been reported in cycling and in weight class and leanness sports. Next slide, please. As with the female athlete, um, male athletes can exhibit multiple pathways to low EA, low energy availability, disordered eating or eating disorders, including intentional weight loss, inadvertent under eating. So a lot of times it's just that they don't know that they need to you know, eat so many calories a day if they're running 80 miles a week, um, disordered eating and clinical eating disorders. So any of these pathways can contribute to failure to consume adequate volume of calories to meet the needs of the athlete's exercise energy expenditure. So what's important to know is that the outcomes can be the same or often the same, whether it be inadvertent or um, intentional, um, that you can still see the hormonal and skeletal negative outcomes. And so that, that is a very important to understand. The underlying motivations that contribute to undereating does seem to differ in male and female athletes, and there's more that we need to learn about this. Um, so we can't necessarily rely on the same criteria that have been applied to exercising women um, in exercising men. Next slide, please. And this is the recommended screening questionnaire that, um, is, that we recommend for those male athletes that are at risk um, at the pre-participation exam. So similar questions to the female athlete for the first six, um, 
In the last four, um, we recommend including these in the pre-participation exam for post-pubertal athletes. And those include, have you ever been diagnosed with low testosterone levels? Do you have low libido or sex drive? Do you have morning erections? Do you need to shave your facial hair less frequently? So these are some important questions in um, the young male athlete. And this also is in uh, the papers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, for With regards to the clearance and re return to play guidelines, uh, we do recommend them also in the male athlete, especially in those male athletes at risk, the lean sport athletes, the endurance athletes. Uh, we have found that similar to the female athlete, that the evidence-based risk assessment protocols that I'll um, show you in a minute, very similar to the female athlete, um, they've also been very well studied and um, have been found to be predictive uh, for bone stress injury and impaired bone health. And we do encourage that. So that's for both the female athlete triad cumulative risk assessment and the male athlete triad. Uh, those that use those, um, you can you know, easily screen in just a few minutes by using this cumulative risk assessment um, and help to predict those at risk for bone stress injury and impaired bone health. Um, this is um, basically the same as the female athlete triad minus the menstrual minus the delayed menarche and um, oligomenorrhea and amenorrhea. So it's the, um, the four um, risk factors that are mentioned here. And um, we also have the stratification of magnitude of risk and, uh, and then tallying the points. Um, and in the next slide, we see that um, the clearance and return to play guidelines um, are based on the cumulative risk assessment. And so this can be very, very helpful at the time of the pre-participation exam when we have an athlete at risk, whether or not we um, recommend you know, clearing them or not, limited clearance or restricting them. In the meantime, we're getting more data, lab tests, you know, um, seen, seen by the dietitian, uh, possibly evaluated by the mental health professional, getting the DEXAs back if uh, they meet the criteria for needing a DEXA. Um, and so we gather this information, but in the meantime, uh, we want to protect the athlete because we want to make sure that it's safe for the athlete to participate. So these guidelines have been very helpful and, as mentioned earlier, um, have been predictive for uh, bone stress injury and uh, bone health. So uh, very helpful uh, to use. So in summary, for the male athlete triad, there's evidence of energy deficiency and low energy availability in subsets of male athletes, particularly those who participate in leanness sports. But the magnitude and duration of the energy deficiency um, or low energy availability required for the metabolic hormone alterations in the males is, seems to be more severe than that in the females. So that's the main difference that we found. There may be multiple pathways to disordered eating and eating disorders in the male athlete. Um, and the psychological underpinnings can vary between the male and female athlete. The clearance and return to play guidelines are recommended similar to the female athlete to optimize prevention and treatment. And similarly, we have shown in both male and female athletes that using these guidelines um, have been very helpful to, um, and predictive for bone stress injury and impaired bone health. So we do recommend these at the time uh, of the uh, pre-participation exam or at other times when you're evaluating the athlete that have uh, one or more of the uh, triad. And improving uh, energetic status or nutrition through optimal fueling, again, is the mainstay of treatment. Uh, rarely do we need to use uh, medications and things. So it's usually working with that multidisciplinary team, addressing each component uh, that is affected in the athlete and um, improving their nutrition, of course, um, addressing the mental health um, aspects uh, in those that do where there is that concern. Thank you. We're going to save our questions uh, for the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Joy and Dr. Nitti, for your insightful presentation on the female and male athlete triads. Our last speaker tonight will be Dr. Lee Mancini. Um, Dr. Lee Mancini is a board-certified sports medicine physician, a certified sports nutritionist, and a certified strength and conditioning specialist with distinction. He is an associate professor of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. 
He serves as both Chief of the Division of Sports and Exercise Medicine and Director of the Primary Care Sports and Exercise Medicine Fellowship. He is the Head Primary Care um, Sports Physician for the Worcester Red Sox, AAA, as well as the Team Physician for seven area colleges, including Holy Cross, Nichols College, and Assumption University. He also teaches exercise and nutrition for both the residents and medical students at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. Dr. Mancini also owns and operates Dr. Fitness LLC, which provides instruction in proper fitness training and nutrition to clients and athletes. He has spoken at national and regional conferences on sports nutrition, supplements, steroids, and other exercise and sports medicine topics. With over 25 years of experience, Dr. Mancini has trained numerous high school, college, and recreational athletes, including athletes from the Boston Red Sox minor league system, Fitchburg State College, the College of the Holy Cross, the Worcester Ice Cats, and Lowell Devil of the AHL, Worcester State College, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He lives in Massachusetts with his wife and two teenage daughters who are both athletes themselves. Um, Mr. Dr. Mantini will now be presenting on the importance of sports nutrition on mental health and athletic performance. Thank you so much, Roxana. And this is uh, great to be here to follow uh, three great presentations already. Uh, and I think my talk is going to sort of be the intersection of mental health, nutrition, and athletic performance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of nutrition on mental health, talk about the impact of nutrition on athletic performance and then at the end take some time with the rest of the panelists on questions. And what I'd like to do is start with this quote by Hippocrates, which is, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And that's really what my talk is gonna be about to present some actionable steps and real world research to sort of combine evidence and experience on this topic. So to start, I wanna talk about three ways in which nutrition affects mental health. We're gonna talk about sugar consumption, probiotics in the gut microbiome, and omega-3 fatty acids. So the first topic I want to talk about is how sugar consumption, the relationship between that and mental health. So to, to start with, a um, great article that came out last year in May of 2021 in the Journal of Preventing Chronic Disease. In this case, they looked at sugar-sweetened beverages, i.e. sodas, and, and found that if someone was consuming more than one can of soda a day or one can or more uh, compared to individuals who are consuming no cans of soda a day, they had a 26% greater prevalence of poor mental health. That was a diagnosis of depression, suicidal ideation, um, anxiety, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. And for those of you, one can of soda gives you about 10 teaspoons. The other thing I find really interesting is that one can of soda is the equivalent of three and a quarter donuts. Um, so again, two donuts, not nearly as much sugar as they're in one can of soda. Another study from 2010 in the Journal of Public Health Nutrition looked at almost 5,000 participants and found that if you were, they were intaking more than half of a liter or over 17 ounces of soda daily, there was a 60% greater chance that they had a mental health disorder such as anxiety, depression, or suicidal ideation. And there was even a correlation between the more soda an individual was consuming, the higher the risk. In fact, the odds ratios went to even one to two, um, so almost two times more likely with more ounces of soda consumption. And then not to, to expand more than just sugar-sweetened beverages and soda consumption, there was a 2017 study in the Journal of Scientific Reports where they looked at 23,000 person observations. And in this cross-sectional analysis, when they made all of the other variables equal and just look at, looked at overall sugar consumption, that top quartile of patients who were, had a higher rate of sugar consumption had a 23% greater risk of a common mental disorder and depression. So they sort of factored out um, other diet-related factors, other comorbid conditions, smoking stat status, body fat percentage, and just looked at sugar consumption. And that's what they found. So a strong link between increased intake of more sugar and, men and mental health. 
Now I wanna to transition to point number two with nutrition and mental health and looking at the gut microbiome. And this is really an area that's really exploded over the past 10 to 15, 20 years, and I think will be even more impactful in the next 20 years going forward. Interesting about the gut microbiome, you have more by weight species of microbes in your gut, two kilograms total, than the weight of your brain, which is 1.4 kilograms on average. So almost 50% more by weight gut microbiota than your brain health. The other important fact is that our body has 20,000 genes, but actually your gut microbiome contains 20 million genes. And all these microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi, archaea, are able to make and use nutrients in ways our body is unable to. So they really serve huge functions within our body. And I wanna highlight that by this next slide, which is the gut-brain axis. And this shows how you know people talk about and when they talked about female athlete triad, Dr. Joy and Dr. Natif, you know, that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but also there's an axis connecting the brain, the vagus nerve, our gut health, and the microbiome, secreting neurotransmitters, short chain fatty acids, lipopolysaccharides, and affecting brain health as well. In fact, back in 1998, rats were injected with Campylobacter dejuni and they were found to cause anxiety-like behavior in those rats, and they found an uptake in neuronal regions of the brain that was receiving information from the gut from the vagus nerve. So again, that, that gut health, microbiota, um, vagus nerve, brain axis in full effect. And so it's not surprising that our gut bacteria makes 95% of our body's supply of serotonin, which is why gut health and mental health are really linked hand in hand. And in fact, our gut bacteria produce those SCFAs that I just mentioned that have neuroactive properties by fermenting dietary fiber and resistant starch. So, those, so our gut microbiome creates these compounds that then help with neurotransmitters and affecting mental health. Now on the flip side of a healthy gut microbiome, both stress, whether it's emotional stress, psychological stress, physical stress, or just overall inf inflammation in our gut health weakens that intestinal barrier, and that leads to leaky gut syndrome. And what they've found is that with leaky gut syndrome, you get this leakage of lipopolysaccharides into the blood, which can cause problems throughout the body and in the brain, and that patients with anxiety and depression and other mental health disorders have higher circulating levels of lipopolysaccharides. A review article in the Journal of Nutrients in May of 2021 showed that patients with major depressive disorder had a shift in their gut microbiome. They had a decrease in bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, uh, fecali bacterium, and ruminococcus, where they increased five other types of bacteria. So this, this compound and sort of complex ecosystem in our gut, shifting different types of bacteria has, a, has an effect on the gut health and on the brain health. And there was a 2017 systematic review by Wallace and Malev where they looked at 10 clinical trials that showed by actually supplementing with probiotics that they decreased depressive symptoms in patients with major depressive disorders. So there's a lot of evidence in the literature showing that, that probiotics can help positively shift your gut microbiome and thereby have a positive impact on mental health for patients who already have uh, depression um, and anxiety. And my last topic to talk about in terms of mental health and nutrition is looking at omega-3 fatty acids. And in particular, when you look at the standard American diet or the SAD diet, um, we tend to have a diet that's way too high in a lot of omega-6 fatty acids, which are pro-inflammatory and not enough omega-3s. And in particular, DHA and EPA, which are two essential fatty acids uh, found in fish oil, blue-green algae, krill oil, um, and they have been shown to decrease total body inflammation and also inflammation in our gut. And when we look with patients who have major depressive disorder, they have higher levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, tuminocrosis factor alpha, 
and C-reactive proteins. And so when they've looked at studies with omega-3 um, fatty acid supplementation, they have an anti-inflammatory effect on gut health. There's information about patients with IBS, Crohn's disease, ulcer of colitis. Um, and we know already with leaky gut syndrome that if you can decrease that gut inflammation, that that helps with brain health as well. And there have been several meta-analyses showing that omega-3 supplementation is beneficial to patients with major depressive disorder and supplementing with just one to two grams per day. So now I'm gonna switch gears in my talk for three ways in which nutrition can affect athletic performance since we just talked about three ways nutrition can affect mental health. And I first wanna start with, with calories. And I know this has already been really excellently discussed by Drs. Joy and Natif, but I think it, it bears me highlighting again that the impact of calories and athletic performance, and especially staying out of that negative energy balance, because when you go into that negative energy balance, there's an increased risk of stress fractures. Um, you have um, T3, or um, one of your thyroid hormones decreased. You have slower phosphocreatine recovery rates, which is tied into explosive power, those first zero to 10, zero to 20 seconds of exercise. So athletes are unable to train as frequently they're unable to recover as completely. And then again, there's this concept of this hypometabolic catabolic state, which, com which encompasses all of those things, low T3, low insulin uh, growth factor one, high levels of cortisol releasing hormone, high cortisol levels, which makes it hard to both maintain or increase lean muscle mass, makes an athlete more susceptible to injury. It slows down their metabolic rate and leads to an increase of breakdown of lean tissue um, which again is what we really want to avoid. And this is, this is more a predictive equation for total energy expenditure for athletes as far as how many calories that they need. Um, I tend to use as a basic starting point for my athletes um, when, we're, when I'm trying to make sure they're taking enough calories is to double their body weight, multiply that by 10, and I start that as at least a reasonable starting point if we don't want to plug anything into this uh, formula. And I will say one final word on calories because a calorie is not a calorie. Um, if you look more deeply into the nutritional research that yes, adequate calories are an important component of nutrition to ensure success and performance is related to that positive energy balance, but the quality of what you put in your body is just as important as the quantity, right? If someone's taking in the same total calories and the same macronutrient ratios of fat, protein, and carbohydrates, but one person's getting their carbohydrates from soda and french fries and their protein from a Big Mac, and someone else is getting their protein and healthy fat from wild-caught salmon and their carbohydrates from, from broccoli and quinoa, they're gonna be, be overall much more healthy. You're gonna, you know already about the impact on the gut microbiome of some of those nutritional choices, um, immune system health, and overall performance. So quality of food does matter as much as the quantity, but you do wanna make sure you're taking in enough total calories. Protein, and, and protein is a, is a really important one. Um, the recommended daily allowance for protein is only 0.36 grams per pound body weight, and that's to maintain a, a, an a equilibrium in terms of nitrogen balance. But the literature over the last 30, 40 years is overwhelming that athletes need more protein than, than a sedentary population. And there is positive indications here. On the top, there's a study with endurance runners on bone health. Again, going back to the female athlete triad, the male athlete triad, um, the study by Townsend in the Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise from 2017, looked at that when you had an increased amount of protein intake in your diet, um, <clears throat> there was less bone reabsorption and more bone uh, formation because of changes in different types of collagen and pro-collagen. There was a meta-analysis that was done in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2012 that showed when you increase protein intake um, greater than 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight and even further about 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram, which again is about 0.7 to 0.9 grams per pound, you had a greater amount of both strength and muscle gains in type one and type two muscle cross-sectional area. And then there have been systematic reviews 
showing that ideally for athletes, you wanna get about 0.8 to 1.0 grams per pound um, body weight. And with the systematic review, it's been shown enhanced um, blood glucose levels, decreased blood triglyceride levels, improved bone health, um, higher uh, diets higher in key nutrients like calcium, phosphorus, iron, zinc, and thiamine. Um, and someone always asks at some point when I'm ever talking about nutrition about what about, you know, is protein bad for your kidneys? There have been a number of systematic reviews of the liter literature that have been published um, and that studies have shown that protein intake, even as high as two grams per pound body weight, which is double what I'm talking about, has been shown to be safe for someone who has healthy kidneys. And the last point that I want to talk about is water. And it's not, you know, as sexy as the gut micro microbiome or, or um, you know, protein and calorie intake, but water is really critical for, for, for overall athletic performance. Um, these are two good studies, one on endurance athletes and one on strength athletes. A study by Barr in 1999 had two groups of cyclists ride for two hours. Then one group was able to rehydrate, one group wasn't. The re they both then went at 90% of their VO2 max, so pretty much an all out sprint until exhaustion. And the group that was able to rehydrate went twice as far as the group that wasn't. Um, and also by the study by Schofstall in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research in 2001 showed that even a decrease in body weight due to dehydration of one or 2% led to a five to 10% decline in one rep max bench press performance. So a pretty significant strength deficit. And when you look at the overall literature on hydration and performance, that with 1% um, of body weight loss due to dehydration, you have a problem with thermal regulation, so there's increased risk for heat stroke, um, heat illness. At 2%, you have a decrease in cardiac output, changes in cognitive awareness, change, decrease in time to exhaustion, and 2 to 4% a decrease in agility, a decrease in sports-specific skills. They actually looked at free throw shooting and basketball players and quarterbacks' abilities to, to, to hit and throw a target. So water really is tied in um, to how our body's functioning and for athletic performance. And these are the American College of Sports Medicine's recommendations for water. I simplify it from their, um, from their recommendations a little bit, but pre-workout about 24 ounces um, a couple hours prior. During workouts, six ounces every 15 minutes or 12 ounces every 30. And then post-workout, 16 to 24 ounces per pound weight loss. And then just to make sure when you're hydrating to not forget to get in enough sodium as well. And then since this is a talk about mental health, nutrition, and performance, I find that alcohol in athletes is a nice intersection between the three. And it's been shown in the literature that alcohol consumption reduces rates of muscle protein synthesis even following exercise. And even with protein supplementation, where they had people drink alcohol and then do a protein shake, they found a five times less reduction in muscle protein synthesis. So alcohol really impairs growth and impairs muscle recovery. And yet we still see you know, our college athletes and our high school athletes and our professional athletes you know, having issues both with alcohol around training. So to, to sum up my talk and, and my take home points is focus on quality carbohydrates specifically fruits and vegetables and cutting out a lot of those processed carbohydrates and sugar, since we know that, that sugar has an impact on mental health. Sugar also negatively affects the gut microbiome. It fields a lot of fuels and feeds a lot of those unhealthy gut bacteria at the expense of our more positive gut bacteria. Two, make sure you know, we're taking probiotics to help balance out that gut microbiome. Three, make sure you're getting enough omega-3 fatty acids like fish oil, um, aim for about 0 0.8 to one gram of protein per pound body weight, make sure your athletes are getting enough calories. And like I said, you know, if you don't wanna focus on that, the complicated formula that I showed, that body weight times 20 is a good starting point and don't forget about drinking enough water. And since I started with a quote um, by Hippocrates, I'll end with one, which is the greatest medicine of all is teaching people how not to need it. And then obviously I'll finish with one more slide. Um, these are my two 
um, teenage daughters, um, two hockey pictures taken uh, 10 years apart um, with them. And uh, you know, we try to make sure we instill good mental health and uh, good nutrition habits on my two. So thank you very much, everyone. And then I have some references. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Mancini, for your wonderful presentation on mental health and nutrition. We will now begin the Q&A session. So um, anyone, please feel free to enter your questions in the chat, and we'll give everyone a moment. One of the questions um, while we're waiting for folks to type, uh, I actually had a personal uh, question for Dr. Diamond. You listed several tips for approaching athletes about mental health. So um, as we see a lot of student athletes are underage, when approaching them about mental health, are there any tips or challenges for approaching the conversation with both the athlete and their parent or guardian present? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good, good question. Um, I, I think, you know, what you glean from both parties is important. Uh, I think uh, part of it is establishing trust um, before the visit. I know with our adolescent medicine providers, um, there's a time for the family to be all together and there's a time where it's separate. And so um, it's just part of the routine. And so the more you do that, it's not looked upon as you know something different or the child's hiding um, something. So I think the more you make it part of the ordinary that this happens, uh, then it's not something unusual to ask when you're concerned about something. And I think it engenders trust um, with both um, the, the patient and the, and the family. But I think again, making it part of the norm um, helps you for any future visit. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question in chat from Jennifer Mitchell. Uh, what level of leptin do you tend to see with low energy availability and does it go up or down? Low energy availability is usually associated with reduced leptin, but we don't you know, typically measure leptin. It uh, fluctuates. A lot. I mean, it's not. Uh, we actually did some research looking at leptin, uh, but uh, it it's not uh, for, for with regards to the clinical significance in athletes. It's, uh, it's not at the stage I think that we would get that as uh, you know routine lab. But um, it is typically reduced with low energy availability. Thank you, Dr. Matif. Uh, we have a question from Carly Sederberg. Um, uh, how do you begin to address eating disorders with your student athletes? Yeah, this is Liz. I'm happy to take that one. Um, you know, this is, um, I think it's, it's less problematic um, when, as some of the other speakers have said, is we just kind of normalize the conversation you know, around, um, you know, really fueling your body, you know, for health and um, performance and quality of life. And when we start to have conversations about that and, you know, through that elicitation, you realize that the individual, you know, has, is, is not fueling themselves um, and that they're having concerns about food, weight, and body image, you can really engage in a very non-judgmental conversation about it with them. And oftentimes, I would say the vast majority of times, 90 plus percent of the time, you know, um, the athlete has been waiting for an opportunity to actually talk to somebody about what's going on. And it creates, you know, now, um, you know, a, a forum for you to have that conversation. You won't learn everything, you know, their very first visit, far from it. But now it's about connecting them to the right resources you know, and working with your sports dietitian um, and a trusted mental health provider. And really we describe it on our team as really creating the kind of the healthcare hug, you know, where that patient really feels like a team of individuals, you know, that talk to each other, that share a philosophy of care are all there to help them feel better, you know, for them to have better health, 
for them to form, perform better as an athlete, for them to enjoy high school or college or whatever, whatever they happen to be doing. And I think it creates hope and it creates safety. And um, so we, we need to be comfortable having that conversation and we need to identify the resources, you know, within our community and then connect athletes to those resources. I think, you know, it's, it's, it starts out hard, but it gets really easy if you do that. No, that was great. I agree with everything. I'll just, I'm just a quick addition. Um, I do tend to wait until a little bit later after I've um, established a, a more of a bond with the athlete before starting to ask uh, the questions about in eating disorders, you know, going through the uh, questions that we ask uh, just to develop that rapport first, because it is, you know, sometimes there's embarrassment and, and if they don't feel a bond, they may not be honest. So I do think it's important um, to try to, you know, talk about other associated symptoms or something else to, you know, initially get that bond and then, um, and then get to uh, that part. Um, so it's not as difficult for the athlete. Um, a follow-up question to that. Thank you, Dr. Joy and Dr. Nativ. Uh, at your facilities, are mental health professionals readily available? And if not, what community sources do you refer your um, athletes to when the time comes that it is necessary? So I'll respond from the perspective of a um, now I'm I'm and at various times in my career I've been really caring for athletes in a community setting. Um, and not always, you know, at a, you know, division one uh, university, you know, with all sorts of resources, but we really um, have uh, strived to create a network of professionals. And um, we now have a team of about 16 people that includes myself and registered dietitians within our healthcare system, as well as community-based dietitians and community-based mental health providers. And we seek people with different types of expertise people who have expertise in athletes, people who have expertise in um, kind of vulnerable populations, um, people who have expertise in eating disorders and substance use disorder, people with expertise in family-based therapy. So we have really sought to kind of create, or I should say I have sought to create and really curate a network of professionals in the community. We also do it by payer, recognizing that, you know, not every, um, you know, not every patient that sees me, you know, is on the same health insurance, right? And I need to have, you know, practitioners who are on all sorts of different health insurance plans, you know, and I know those individuals and we come together on a weekly basis and we round on our patients. And, um, and so we really have, you know, created that team that can give patients the healthcare hug. But I think, you know, um, physicians often are the leaders of that multidisciplinary team, but there's, um, there's really no hierarchy. You know, I, I fully respect, you know, the expertise um, the, of our dietitians and of our mental health providers, and we all play um, overlapping but distinct roles. But it really is, I, I really have said that it's my responsibility, you know, as the physician to really try and find those practitioners who share similar philosophies of care and values and, and bring them in to be the team that cares for people who are affected by eating disorders. Thank you so much, Dr. Joy. Um, we have one more question from Tammy. I've noticed that many kids get their pre-participation physical evaluations done during their well child visit appointments. Um, since pediatricians are optimally allotted about 15 to 20 minutes per patient, what questions would you recommend asking to screen for disorder eating? For instance, we often use the PHQ-2 as a brief initial screening for major depression. Is there a similar equivalent for disorder eating or a female athlete triad or a male athlete triad? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure many others have some thoughts here, but I'll just add that... Um, you know, we do have the questions that I shared within the um, pre-participation exam that is in the pre-participation monograph that is um, created and supported by AMSSM and ACSM and a variety of other AAP, AFP, you know, a number of different organizations. 
So um, those questions can certainly help to identify somebody who may be um, at risk for an eating disorder or disordered eating and menstrual dysfunction and bone stress injuries. Um, the screening tool that we recommend um, that our primary care providers use is the ESP or the Eating Disorder Screen in Primary Care. And um, then there's kind of a modified ESP and um, which is kind of more of a parent response. So, um, and there's the scoff and there are other tools, but um, I think the ESP is probably best for a, a US um, population. And um, we're not using it within the PPE, um, but it is recommended as part of um, adolescent well care. Now, having said all that, the US Preventive Services Task Force you know, recently came out and gave um, routine screening for eating disorders in adolescents an eye recommendation, meaning there's insufficient evidence to su suggest that um, screening for eating disorders will improve outcomes. But, you know, that doesn't mean you don't do it. It just means there's insufficient evidence. So I can tell you that within our healthcare system, we are still recommending the use of the ESP as part of adolescent well care to screen people for eating disorders. And if they screen in then performing a more in-depth assessment to see whether or not you know, they meet um, criteria and what should be the next steps in their evaluation and management. And especially with regards to the athlete, um, the questions on the PPE um, are the ones that um, are the best you know, studied for athletes. So um, those are the ones approved by AMSSM, ACSM, American Academy of Family Medicine, um, Healing practice and uh, AAP, um, so it's all the same. That um, that PPE that uh, we used does have uh, those initial questions, and then if an athlete scores high on those, a young athlete, um, then you can go to the more detailed ones, uh, like the ones Liz mentioned, or eating disorder inventory, or others. Um, but those are really good for general screening. Um, and and oh. in the um, in the position statement, um, there are links to several of the um, for each content, you know, of your different screening questions or tailored questions as part of the detection section of the position statement. So again, that's a good reference starting point too that uh, hits on everything that um, they just said. Does anyone have any other questions? If there are no further questions, I'd like to thank all of our four speakers for their insightful presentations and for everyone here in attendance. This webinar has been recorded and the playback recording will be posted on the AMSSM YouTube channel and also on the student page of the AMSSM website. I'd like to also announce our next MSIG webinar on starting an interest group at your medical school, which will be held on Tuesday, October 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern time. This will be a fun interactive webinar session where there will be polls with the medical students and faculty advisors in attendance that lead into discussion with our large speaker panel of two faculty champions that serve as faculty advisors and eight of our charter medical schools connected to MSIG. The speaker panel will also share their advice and recommendations about starting an interest group to medical students and faculty advisors that want to start an interest group at their medical school. And also, please make plans now to join our MSIG webinar on Tuesday, November 15th, that begins at 8.45 p.m. Eastern Time on the Agostini Medical Student Community Outreach Grant to learn more about this grant opportunity and meet the four grant recipients of 2022 and listen to them give highlights of the event they will implement with the grant funds. Thank you all very much.